we are today. Um, so Randy, the news hound that he is, found a cool article about uh, solar storms. You might know that the Earth, or sorry, the Sun goes on an 11-year magnetic cycle where basically um, the solar storms are going to reach their their apogee uh, every 11 years. And um, we're coming up on that. In the 2025, it's going to be the next peak. So um, that means that increasingly until then, and on any given day, there's more likely to be like solar activity, solar you know, space weather, as the article calls it, you know, um, radiation jets kind of shooting out from the sun. The Earth's atmosphere protects us, but this has consequences um, for uh, people in planes, crew in planes, especially because they, you know, they say there's a week of a lot of solar activity. They're up there every day of the week, many hours a day. Obviously, they're going to get more radiation than people who are protected by the atmosphere that are on the ground or only flying a little bit. So that's a thing. Um, and uh, it can also mess with technology. Apparently, during Hurricane Irma, things were, there was a lot of solar activity, and like it basically made ham radios unable to work for a period when like emergency services really needed to use those radios. So there can be real consequences, and it's one of those things where it you know i think as like the world becomes less likely to be nice on any given day because like global warming there's more and more chance of this sort of becoming a um an issue when we need to be able to do something relying on electronic communication plus our world is increasingly using electronic communication obviously then you get um more and more of a chance for there to be some kind of calamity as a result of it it's my understanding kind of Kind of not super scary, but a little frightening. Yeah, I mean, I think it just like it fucks with the electromagnetic field and shit starts going bad. Uh, yep. I um, I think it'd be a really bad way to go. Solar flare. <laughs> yeah. Because <clears throat> it's, I I mean it's one of, it's one of those things, right? Like you have to. You, you have to wonder, like, how how realistic is the danger? Like, is it just a matter of, like, the power goes out everywhere for a second? Or or what it could be? I don't know. I can't imagine there's going to be, like, an electromagnetic pulse that kills all the technology, but... Yeah, it sounds like it would be pretty unlikely that it would affect, like, heat. Or, you know, like, the, like that the... Uh, like electrical power sources, electricity going through wires, but very likely to affect anything that goes through radio. That's going to get frazzed, potentially. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 one of those stories that's like, it doesn't have, like, immediate implications. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's really, uh, it's really freaky that if it, like, if a solar storm can be bad, I mean, obviously it hasn't been bad enough to, like, do anything awful so far as far as I can tell anyway but I, I'm in this article they say we only get 60 to 90 minutes warning so uh, 69 minutes what? 60 to 90 warning. minutes warning about these, oh, yeah, uh, that's, these solar storms that's interesting one of the interesting things is that the way that we know it's the way that we know it's coming is satellites that are how what was it like a million miles away in Earth's orbit they must be placed such that they can detect a solar storm before it gets here, right? Um, no matter where on the sun, where on the where the sun is relative to the Earth, um, and then they get that signal and they send that signal back to the Earth, and it takes a certain amount of time, obviously, to travel to the Earth as well, because we're talking about the speed of light. Um, and I actually don't quite understand how they're able to detect the solar radiation before it gets to them. Maybe they are actually measuring the some you know the the field between them and the sun, so they can see some kind of perturbation before uh, it doesn't make much sense to me to be honest I guess I just don't understand enough about how they detect it that they can get the message to us before the storm gets to us but we do get that that 90 minutes of warning that little window where we can if we need to react if we need to adjust something protect like a technology system we can do that and they say there's actually ways to improve our technology so it's less likely to cause some kind of crisis using non-magnetic steel for example just making components that are protected from 
the like fluct like changes in the magnetic field that are yeah protected from like unpredictable patterns of radiation then like you can actually preempt a lot of the the uh chance of a horrible failure so so i i just i i just wanted to look up the um how many how many miles is in an astronomical unit which if i'm correct is is the distance between the earth and the sun right i think so yeah so so that is uh 92,955,807 miles. So, yeah, our satellites are 192nd of a uh, of a barrier between us. That's that's crazy, which gives you an idea of how uh how long these uh these things travel before they get to us. It's interesting. Um the article also talks about the um UK National Grid running drills frequently to uh, to deal with this kind of thing. Really? Yeah. Um, I didn't see that part. That's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the UK National Grid. Oh, in the UK National Grid. So it's actually the same as us. Yeah. Presumably. National Grid is a company that I has an international presence. Kind of freaky. Yeah, I assumed it was like the NHS over there. Uh, th so they're building up their supply of spare transformers and conducting regular drills to deal with a major space weather event, said Mark Prowse. Now, what I want to know is what other space weather is there? I have absolutely no concept of that. Yeah, there's solar storms. Is there like a solar rainbow? Uh, space hail? Oh, space hail. Got like oh, yeah, a... space hail definitely exists. Like, <laughs> like everything in space is a, a, a giant block of ice. Yeah. <laughs> it's a everything is like a space ice Manhattan out there. Right, I guess there's solar wind too, which I don't know how it's related. I think it's also a jet of radiation, so But surely it all can't be sun weather. There must be other weather. Right, there's gotta be some you know, other star weather. Exploding things weather. Well yeah, I mean if the sun's got weather, everything's probably got weather that's also a star, but I don't know. Is uh, uh, maybe we should do maybe we should we should do the next one about other space weather. I have no idea what. I mean, like you, you hear about like weather on other planets. Yeah. Like that one where it, like rains glass sideways. I don't know about that. Oh yeah, it's like well, it's like silica. Mm. That it just like roars mm -hmm. around the planet. Wow. There's the diamond planet where it like I think there's one I think there's a planet where it rains diamonds. Really? Yeah. All right. I'm um. I'll I'll research the weather of every I'm single planet. Having a hard planet. time believing that, but cool. If true, big. It if might true, it might be know. that the planet is a diamond. Uh. It's definitely a, there's definitely planets that are believed to have large amounts of diamonds. Okay. The first there. thing that comes up is planet rains diamonds. Deep within Neptune and Uranus, it rains diamonds. Wow. Or so astronomers and physicists have suspected for nearly 40 years. I stand possibly corrected. Yeah. Only a single space mission, Voyager 2, or if you're a fan of Star Trek, V'ger, has flown by to reveal some of their secrets, so diamond rain has only remained a hypothesis. Or it remained only a hypothesis. But that's not space weather. That's, that's planetary weather. There's got to be, like, do you watch Doctor Who? No. Oh, well, no. there's an episode where there's uh, whales that, like, traverse space. I guess that's in Star Wars, too, but I, I think... There's also an episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog where that happens. I gotta watch that show. That's a great show. We should do an episode on that show if you ever watch it. I fucking love Courage. Well, I mean, I watched it all the time as a kid. Yeah, me too. It's like one of those, it's like one of those shows that, like, got me into scary stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that show had, like, great vibes. Really cool, yeah. creepy, like, horror vibes. I watched a great video essay about it recently. I think it might have been from Jacob Geller or somebody. Mm, about Courage? Cool. Or, like, Philosophy Tube. Or Philosophy Tube. Yeah, maybe not Philosophy Tube. Probably not. Wisecrack or something, maybe. Mm. Dude, I gotta tell you, I've been playing the new Resident Evil. Yeah. Which, if you don't know, 
it's not like the movies the games are fucking scary and uh this one does baby horror and it's fucked up baby horror yeah ooh there's a I just I just ran into a monster that is like a giant it's like very Silent Hill if you've ever seen Silent Hill I don't, or I'm sure you haven't played the games but it's just like it looks almost like a cricket but it's like a giant melted flesh pile that makes baby sounds and like the whole thing of the game is that you're like trying to get the there's like an evil like bioweapons company that took well maybe I don't know I don't know how it pans out in the game yet but anyway you find your daughter is in many different vials and you're going to put her back together and there's like a lot of baby horror it's fuck it's fucking scary wow yeah it's it, it Resident Evil went from like have you ever seen the movies no oh man well they're ridiculous it's like watching a Nick Cage movie or something Mm. And they they decided we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to make scary games again. Cool. I got to I want you to I want to sit you down and like uh like with a VR helmet and play a Resident Evil or something. I'd gladly do it. Especially if I can get scared. Yeah. I don't usually get scared scary. easily. I did get really scared at a haunted house one time. See, oh well I I would love to hear about that if you want to keep doing the appendix. Uh I um I don't get scared at like movies and books. Books sometimes just like if they're really well written, but video games get me because it's interactive. And um, if it's like got that immerse immersion level, it really makes me feel like I'm dealing with it in real life. Word. I have to imagine VR would just compound that. I so get that much. with Slenderman a little bit. Watching people play Slenderman as well is enough. That was a, I mean, that was a scary game for its time. That like. Yeah. Uh, I play a lot of scary games, and that like that like set the mold for a while. Mhm. It's good. Pretty good game. <laughs> yeah, Thunderman's like a good scary one. I mean, he's basically like injured cold, but. Mhm. Or I would get scared playing. What's the name? Ah, uh, well, I'll, I don't know the name of that game, so I'm not gonna try to bring it up. But um. Fright Nights is where I got, I got spooked at a haunted house. Where's Fright Nights? Cosmic. I think that. You could buy like multiple Hong Kong and house things. I don't know if we bought more than one, but it's it used to be Friday nights at the fair. That's what I think of, but it's mm -hmm. no longer at the fair. It's somewhere in the greater Syracuse area. Like out the of only the thing city. I've ever done is like one of the, the haunted hay rides that we do around here. Mm. But I don't remember being all that scared by that. I probably got pulled out. It was mm -hmm. I was very little. Some of those were cool. I remember a giant praying mantis off to the side in the woods at the Boo Barn when I was a kid. Dude. Boo Barn was good. Oh, that's that fucking baby. It looked like the the baby monster in that game. It looked like a cricket that was made out of like a bunch of melted babies. That's horrible. It was so fucking scary. I I would love to, I would love to have like a good haunted house or like uh I, I like an escape room. I don't know if there's an, a good escape room in Syracuse. I don't think they're that good. At least I, I did them years ago to be honest, but I did a yeah. few at the um, See, I the mall. One of one of the things that I I, I like love in theory, except whenever, like, you almost get a chance to do it when you're, like, reading a book or playing a game or watching a show or something. You can't really solve a mystery mm -hmm. or, like, solve puzzles in, like, a tense situation. Yeah. Because there's never actually any stakes. Yeah. And I get there's not an escape room either, but, like, I don't know. Sometimes I think I would do well if I was in, like, a saw situation. What I like about Gertrude Stein, not the same thing, but I feel like you, she kind of forces you to, when she's being more didactic, she kind of forces you to learn with her. Like while she walk, talks through something, you're kind of there. And yeah, she's guiding you, but like you realize things that see, feel like they're like more than, sometimes they feel like they're more than what she's saying. But but there's no stakes there either because it's an exploration. It's not driving toward something, yeah. you know? It's more just a consequence gotta, of your style. I gotta get that. I I got two books in the mail today from the old old Barnes and Noble. Um, this is Clark Ashton Smith, Sh Smith, Sh Sean Connery. Uh, the Dark Eidolon and other fantasies. And I have here Arthur Machen, the works of Arthur Machen. Sweet. House of Souls, The Hill of Dreams, 
The Three Imposters, and Other Tales of the Sacred and Profane. One, it's two, got like the Green Man on the cover. So I'm really excited to find out what that's about. That would be good. At least if I it's got the Great, the Great God Pan in it. That's a very good story. The Great God Pan is very good. Oh, you, yeah, you told you read that before I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's more of his like London detective serendipity stories where it's just like a bunch of like gentlemen talking to each other and moving into each other in and out of each other's apartments and restaurants that they frequent and stuff and just talking but then there's some really weird shit too yeah Arthur Mackin's cool yeah um shit what else there's some oh um I I wanted to recommend an Instagram account for you to follow okay um, at Briscoe Park, B R I S C O E Park. Mm. He's um he's like a I I I feel like he's like a horror movie cinematographer. Mm. But he's 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 just a really fantastic photographer. Cool. Takes like good scary photos. Check it out. Um. But uh, yeah. Uh, so so. Being able to like put together a mystery is one of the things that really appeals to me about Dungeons and Dragons, and it's such a shame that I, <laughs> we I I never got I've never gotten to play. Yeah, I've always super wanted to. I was, I bought, <laughs> I bought Jacob a, uh, like a, 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 I don't know what it is, a dungeon manual or something, a dungeon master's guide, to uh, to like host a campaign, and he, he never did. Aww. I don't think if you'd given it to me, it would have worked out any better. No, but, like, me and Jake, like, actively, like, talked about D&D and, yeah. you know, played video D&D games together. Gotcha. Just never got to play actual D&D. Um, okay, well, that's the appendix. I want to talk about Birdman. So, uh, Sweet. we really had to fill out some time. We only made it to 17 minutes. God damn. Oh, it's Okay. I don't, I don't know. Have this to one be was hero heroic. Well, yeah, this one was kind of a sleeper, but I hope everybody enjoyed it. At least you got some good music. Yeah.